Hello and welcome to A Lot of Help with James Lott Jr. I am the James Lott Jr. of A Lot of Help. I'm a certified life coach, among other things. And we also like to talk to people who are helping affect change in the world. And this person certainly is doing that with this book that literally will stay with you after you read it. It's a page turner, not in the way you think either. Uh, but it's just, it's a book that goes. She's a speaker, author, mother, advocate, sharing her experiences nationally to audiences. Her goal is to break the silence of addiction, which we need to, and inspire those in charge to initiate strategies and open the dialogue. Yes, get rid of the shame, get rid of all the craziness behind it. Her book is called Cardboard House, go with a K, I like that. My Life Altering Journey Through Lucas's Addiction. This is the book, folks. Uh, I was supposed to post it online. This is the book. And help me, Na- help me welcome Nancy Espuche. How are you, Nancy? Thank you, Espuche. Thank you. I'm, I'm fine. Okay, Spooch, yes. Okay, first, okay, I, I have to start off. We, we were just laughing because we're trying to do lighting and stuff issues, and I just cut my head off. There we go. Um, but we want to talk about a serious subject. First of all, um, I'm a parent and grandparent, so I couldn't even imagine. I can't even imagine how you're sitting here and not only wrote a book, how brave you are to write a book about the situation, about your parts, his parts, sharing the letters, everything. I don't know how. I mean, you're you're an example of the human spirit, I guess. And you're the example of that. You're just I don't I don't know how you're standing uh, every day. So I just want to say thank you for writing a book like this. I can almost start crying because I'm just like I, just, I read this book and I was just like I can't even believe it. But you're doing a great service by this book, and you're doing a great service by Lucas. You're doing a great service by you. Um, so I just want to say before we start the interview, thank you for doing this book. Thank you. It means a lot. I really appreciate it. It's I I I just it's I I my my one daughter's had a birthday. My other daughter's like another. It's her birthday in a few weeks. I can't imagine them not being here. I have grandchildren. I have a grandson who's in his twenty, early twenties. I can't imagine him not being here. Um, and so my first question to you is, how are you doing today? Thank you for prefacing and using the word today. I really appreciate that. It's um, people don't really understand fully that that today makes all the difference because it varies day to day and it's never the same. And how am I doing today? Better than I was last week. Last week was the fifth anniversary of Lucas's passing. Um, Like a big birthday, your 50s, your 60s, five years. Felt like it, an awful milestone. And it really brought me back to that day, more so than others have. Um, so today I am, I'm stable, I'm moving. I'm, I'm eager to share my story. I'm eager to get people to listen. Um, whatever I can do to assist in people curtailing this struggle as best they can, although we can't control it. Um, I'm here to do that. And that's what keeps me going. So for today, I'm, I'm well. Good. Very Thank nice you. To hear. Very nice to hear. Um, can you tell me Lucas's full name? I'm going to start out with that. What is his full name? Lucas Anton Espouch. Oh, great name. Great name. Um, and great. do you remember, well, I mean, you were there, obviously, because you gave birth to him. You were there. Um, do you remember any thoughts when he was born? Were there any kind of thoughts? about just like, wow, I have this son, he's here. Are there any any kind of, any thoughts you can remember back then? You know, it's funny. I I never set out to be a professional woman. I I always knew that I would work, Um, but I ended up having a profession, but I always wanted to be a mother. I always wanted to be a mother. I loved being pregnant. It was the best time of my life. Um, I felt so aligned with the soul growing inside of me. And um, when he came out, I was in awe. I was in awe from the whole process. Um, And I did have fear. I was frightened being a new mother. I hadn't been around babies a lot. I did plenty of volunteer work. I worked at NYU Pediatrics ICU unit. Um, So I was around ill babies, which is fortuitous when I think about it now. Right. You know, every road leads you somewhere and you don't really know until it's in your back window kind of thing. There's no coincidences, Um, right? There's no coincidences. No coincidences. Um, And I was frightened. And, you know, as you saw in the book, Lucas started shortly after birth, two months into his birth, he was not feeling very well. And it took a very long time to figure out what was happening for him. So my fear turned into a reality. 
um, but just at the beginning, you know, every peep, every sound, every every motion, all I wanted to do was to keep him right here, so close, and just let him know from that second that he came into the world that he was profoundly loved. Yeah, no, I, I remember um, my daughter came and I was I was so young, but I was ready. I was ready. She was two weeks late too. Her mother was oh. like, "Get her out of me!" And she was like, "She we had a we had a lot of uh, we had a lot of like just just get, get just get." I'm like, "Okay, we got that part." Yeah, that's why I kind of chuckle about that. Her birth. I always said you came when you wanted to come here. Obviously. <laughs> And her personality is very much that. Um, but I remember for me, because um, I didn't have a great childhood, for me, it was my chance to kind of right that wrong, so to speak, as I thought at the time. That's what I thought. I, I now realize later what all it was later as I got older. But at the time, it was like, I'm going to write that wrong, be the father I, wasn't, I, I didn't really have, and I'm going to do all this stuff. So I was excited. But that first year, I was like, are you alive? Are you breathing? Are you Hi. alive? Where's she, where's she go? What's going on here? Like, it's, 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 it's very nerve wracking. For new parents, very nerve wracking. And I, you know, I, I love my mother dearly, but she was not a nurturer. And I was very committed that I was going to write a wrong and I was going to give Lucas everything that I felt that I didn't get. Yeah. Oh, yep. Same here, girl. Same here. But, same, yeah. same here. I, I totally agree with that completely. I was just like, I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to break the cycle. I'm going to just like, you know, and show them, you know, I have two daughters now, but show them that I, I'm, a, I'm here. I'm involved. I'm present. I'm going to just be there for you also let them do what they have to do too which that's what i'm saying it kind of leads to that we're raising children we're there for them but we also have to let them find their way yes uh not easy folks if you're not a parent you know it's, it's hardly to understand if you're a parent you know exactly what i'm talking about um they start to discover things so what wh okay so lucas is a child well i'm going to do this little timeline so lucas is a child what did you see as a child in him? Well, you know, it was com complex because he was sick. Yeah. Um, you know, he had a terrible stomach bout, a problem that nobody knew what was happening for him. And he was in terrible pain a lot. But the ironic thing about it all is that Lucas was always the tallest, <laughs> always the smartest, yeah. always the first to do everything. He rode quickly, he walked quickly, he spoke quickly. Um, and he was a, a, a big kid. So doctors could not equate his age with where he was on the scale of, you know, both physical and mental and emotional. Um, but it was confounded by intermittent bouts of what we now know as pancreatitis. Right. They'd have certain words back then. They didn't know certain things back then. Yes. Um, so yeah. he was curious. He was, you know, when I think back about Lucas, like we'd go to a birthday party and he would observe. He was an observer, but then he needed to get into the middle of it all. And he needed to be, he really needed very much. And he was like that athletically, he was a superstar athlete. And, um, but, you know, things changed as he evolved. And as we learned more and, ha and has, you know, with hospitalizations and such, life really changed. And I learned which I hope to share with you what I've learned about all of this and addiction. Yeah. We're, 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 yeah, we're going to get there too. I was kind of getting a little, I'm going to people a little, I want people to read the book first of all. So I'm not going to tell everything in the book. I want people to read the book. But I kind of want to give a little timeline. So this is what's kind of going on a little bit. Um, and because your journey is, your journey is in this book too. Your journey along with this is in the book. Okay, so now he's a young, he's a, we'll say we'll go to teenage years, almost into young adulthood. Um is that where you started to discover all kinds of things about him? I know, especially looking back, where you, like, so you started to say, okay, now I'm seeing these things, flashes of things. I saw them earlier than that. Mm. I was concerned. I had concerns. He was um, very knee jerk. He was a risk taker. Um, he was haphazard in a way. Um, and he was so, and it, he so overcompensated because of his athletic prowess and his intellect and his charm um, that it was very confusing. But we got him into therapy early. Um, but he had a shield of armor, James, that was really hard to crack. Um, and if he was going to crack it, and I say this with no bravado, we were extremely close. And I always felt that you know, whatever pathway I could lead him down, he would follow. And I just was watching that, that despite our closeness and our love for one another, 
he was dancing to the beat of his own drummer somewhere. Now, have you learned that lesson of you could somebody, someone could say they love you. Someone can, you could feel they love you. You, you can know they want to talk. You guys talk every day. You know, you talk every day. You do all this stuff, but also know there could be a part of them. It's just not accessible. Is that one of the things you learned by doing this book and looking back on the life of Lucas? I learned it sadly before the book. I learned it during his life, and um, it's a big heartache for me because. I really wanted to get in there and I really wanted to help. And the biggest lesson I really learned in all of this is love deeply, but know that it's not within your power to chart anybody's course. You can only do so much, but you cannot take anybody down the path that you want them to go down. It's really up to the individual. And that was a real um, difficult, difficult lesson for me. As a parent, especially, I can, I can right now. I feel so I can feel like, well, I'm like, I want to get in there. I want to do. I want. To, we can't. We're fixers. We want to fix. We want to fix. Right. And you can't. Yeah. You really can't. You can help. You can guide. But you know, there's just so much you can do. I mean, you know, the three C's that you learn along the way. When it, I can't control it, I didn't. I can't cure it, and I didn't cause it. Um, I felt very guilty and often thought, what did I do that I caused it? Big problem. I really thought I could control it. And um, none of it was true. I mean, I learned that over the course of many years. Yeah. But I, believe me, I tried. <laughs> yeah, you're right, right, I'm sure. I right. really tried. Right. And that's the thing. And I think it's a lesson for parents when they read this book too. She she tells you what she does and stuff. I know things are in and all the letters and things going like that it's very much as a parent, you kind of have to let go on some level. You don't want to let go completely, but you like you have to like. They're adults at some point. It's like you. Can, there's only so much you can interject, and I mean, you can't be there twenty four seven seven. You know, you, you just can't do it. And it's so complicated, right? Very complicated because whatever I could tell you is um, from a woman to a man on how to help your child. When you're immersed immersed in this yourself. This is your child. You're not talking about somebody else's child. Nope. Um, you're not separate from that. There is a very different kind of intimacy and connection, and it it's very difficult. Yeah. What was so for folks <clears throat> to read this book? What was Lucas's addiction? Um, Oxycontin and then heroin. And heroin, yes. Which are too strong, folks. You know they're strong, highly addictive, highly addictive substances, opioids. Uh I did not know that he was on heroin. I didn't. And, I, and the last time I saw him was two months before he passed. And I was in California with him and he'd walk around in his box of shorts. And believe me, I was like checking out his body. But um, sadly, I did not know that people use needles between their toes. Yes. So I wasn't looking between his toes. No, of course not. Yeah, you weren't. Yeah, you weren't. Yeah, no. Um. Those are, like I said, those are two heavy things that a lot of folks don't come back from. Some do, but some don't. I'm here in Hollywood. I, I know a lot of friends who didn't come back from them. Uh, they're, again, highly addictive. How did you come to, um, you, talk about this, you talk about this also, but how did you come to fully realize you didn't cause, when the seas, you didn't cause it? You know, it was very much a wave. You know, it ebbed and flowed. It, it I, I still have, in all the full admission, wonder, shoulda, woulda, coulda, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if. I know that I'm playing, you know, a game with myself that's really unhealthy. But again, it, it gives me some sense of maybe. Um, and when I'm really feeling badly, it's easy sometimes to go down that route. Um, and I really have to fight not to. But I don't think. I really got that until after Lucas's passing. Yeah. Because as he was alive, I kept going, well, what can I do different? Or what, I mean, where, what, what's different this time around that I can shift gears or, you know, choose another path to go down? Because, you know, when, when you have a child who goes to four rehab facilities, everybody has a different school of thought. And one's telling you this, and, and, and the one, one place was very much about tough love. And I, I knew, 
Lucas didn't buy it. I didn't buy it. There was no way I was going to do the tough love thing to the degree in which they would like you to. Um, but it's very confusing. I mean, there's a lot of information that you have to process that is so against your natural parental instincts. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's like, what do you mean kick them out of my house? Right. <laughs> I would never do that to my child. Right. But you will. But you would. Maybe. I did at one point or twice. I called the police. Yeah. If you would have told me I would have done any of those things, I would have told you, you're out of your mind. Exactly. No one would think that. No one would think your own child. I would never think that. Never. You think, you know, I, I always think, I always used to laugh when I was a, when I was raising my daughters when they were younger. Wait till they get older and get mouths on. We used to always say things like that. And you, you expect that stuff. You expect the teenage years to be a, a little rough. You know, if you're realistic, I was a teenager, I was rough. So I, I what makes me think my kids are going to be rough too on some level. Like you always assume that stuff. But this stuff, this doesn't even enter your mind. This is way bigger than that. And it takes so long to even accept that it is yes. part of your reality. Because I'm going, okay, maybe this is just, we all experimented. Okay, he's experimenting. Right. right. Um, this is just a phase. He's in this grade. He'll get out of it by the time. And he's such an athlete. There's no way he's going to let any of this get in his way. And blah, 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 blah. Um, until one day you go, okay. Nancy, who are you kidding? You're kidding yourself now. And you're going to hurt your child unless you do something quick. Well, I'm glad you explained, you talk about that. You talk about this whole thing about it's, we always view, a lot of people will view addiction certain ways. Um, and we're showing another side of that. But there are functioning addicts out there. Yes. Very, very much so. Very much so. Yeah. I mean, Lucas got to the point where you would be in a conversation with him and he would do that. Oxycontin not out. He would like fall asleep. Oh, yeah. Yes. Or he was driving his car and suddenly was falling asleep at the, I mean, and, and you go, what's happening? You, you know, what's happening? But, you know, when you have somebody who is really struggling to admit that they've got a problem, it makes it even, and, and all substance abusers do not admit that they have a problem initially. And Many of them don't even admit they have a problem until they're picked up and they're put in jail or they're mandated by the state to get into treatment or they, you know, whatever the case may be. Yeah. It's just, also, it's not one of those things, too, I noticed. I mean, I've had a few incidents happen with my kids, but nothing of that magnitude. But some stuff that happened where you're like, while you're in it going, is this really happening? Am I really, am I dealing with this right now? Like, the, like you look at your kids and go, did you really do that? Like, did you really just do that? Like, you just, you're kind of in the middle of it going, your reality is going, I'm, I'm in this. And they and did James, that. There was so much shame. Yeah. As a parent. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'll never forget. I was walking down the high school. I had a, one day and there were two parents, mothers talking in front of me, not knowing I was behind them. And I heard them say the name Lucas. And then I heard one of the mothers say, I wonder what kind of mother she is. And I, I tapped her on the shoulder just to let her know I was behind her. I said nothing. I just tapped her on the shoulder, she turned around, there I was. And she, but, but I felt it. It was a dagger. Oh, yeah. And, and I felt it in a lot of places. Well, it's you know, Nancy, you know, you know, other parents will shame other parents faster than anybody else. It's awful. Nobody knows what goes on behind closed doors. I agree. Totally agree. What goes on inside one's heart. Right. Nobody knew that Lucas was a sick child. Right. They had no idea what his predisposition to exposure to opioids, which he had plenty of the first four years of his life in the hospitals. So um, nobody- It's easy to throw stones. It is. it is. It and is. I'm saying parents will shame other parents easily or any other place. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, Lucas taught me a lot about kindness because I really will catch myself now if I'm ready to bite or say something because I know what, what I felt like and what happened and what people said about Lucas. And um, he made me a better person. He really so now, did. in terms of how you, how you look at situations, you feel now you're much more well-rounded about that. When you see a situation, you're not just quick to go this way or that way. You're like, I can kind of see it. Fuller? I feel like my tight heart has been broken up. 
Okay, I like that. Okay. I feel like I am able to really embrace situations, people, experiences in a way that I probably would not have before. Mm -hmm. And I'm much less likely to judge. Yeah, so yeah. Oh, yeah. You, have, you include letters in here throughout time. And some letters are very sweet between a mother and a son, and a mother and a son and a mother. Some letters are troubling. You can tell some of the letters. So when you um, go get into also why you get the wrote the, wrote the book or anything, but how important were the letters component to this book? I think they were everything. Yeah. You got a fuller picture. Reading For it. me, so I had, Lucas was a prolific writer and I had hundreds of email, letters and emails. And I said to my best friend after he passed, what if my computer dies? What happens to all those letters? And she said, you have to print out every one of them, which I did. And I had a stack, like literally this big that I just kept near that picture just to know that it was there every day. And one day I said, I want to give voice to Lucas. I want people to know what it felt like to be Lucas. You know, I know there are a lot of books about addiction and a mother and father's journey, all very important. Yeah. But I didn't want to write about my story. I wanted to write about ours because he was the central figure in this tragedy. And I wanted people to know his strength, his weakness, his hope, his desire, his fragility, his vulnerability. Um, and I wanted to expose that. And the only way I really knew how to do that was to put some of those letters in the book. And I, I think, think, yeah, go ahead, please go ahead. I think if I'm to be completely transparent and honest, <laughs> I wanted people to forgive him. I wanted people to see that he was just human and he had, had a problem, but it wasn't purposeful and it wasn't anything he wished for himself. I can't tell you how many people called me and after Lucas passed and said, I had no idea he was struggling. Do you know Lucas saved my life? Do you know Lucas saved my life? Do you know Lucas saved my life? Um, but addiction is a beast and, and opioids are, a beast and they kill. And um, I wanted people not to dismiss Lucas's tender, kind, cherished side. Well, no, it, it, it came through. I mean, I was, I was gonna say to you that it's adding the letters, it does show our, not just him, not just you. It showed we, it really did. Yes. And, we, and we got a stronger picture of who he was. Just, I said, some of the letters were very sweet. They were very sweet letters. Just like, hey, mom, I'm here. I'm doing this, blah, blah. And like, just tell me what he's doing. I'm in the woods. I'm doing this. Like, you know, okay. And then some of the letters are very troubling. So it showed that's the course of life, right? We're seeing the course of their relationship. Um, and when he has issues and when he's doing halfway decent or what he's hiding or what he's not hiding. We saw, I think by adding the letters, that was a, a great piece because also it broke up when you read the book because you're, you're talking about this whole story. Now, okay, now I got a letter to read kind of so it kind of breaks up a little bit so you can read, okay, I'll take a little breather, read the letter. Um, but it also helps. It's almost like exposition when I do when I do shows. It's like it's like it kind of it, it makes sense. It kind of it kind of illuminates the story a little more and gives it some personal feeling. Because um, it's it's the truth to our story. Right. right. It's not from my perspective, my writing. Yeah. Nope. It's what we actually lived mm -hmm. together and shared. So, um, yeah, I think I think it was a very important component. I don't think I would have written the book if I hadn't thought of putting letters in a book. Well, we're, gonna, we're almost going to get to that point. But I, I just have, I mean, just sadly, I just have to ask. So when when he when you find out he's no longer with us, let's say it that way. Um, I'm sure a book was not your thoughts. Right away, was it? I mean, it wasn't. Not at all. Not at all. So, and I, I mean, I'm sure it was a day you'll never forget for the rest of your life, um, clearly. Um, it's, I just, I just, but I want to find out from that point of him losing him, mourning his loss, to deciding. So, some idea of deciding to write a book and place letters on stuff. I kind of want to know where that, that journey for you went. How'd that go? 
You know, I don't remember the exact specifics. I was devastated, devastated, devastated. Oh, yeah, sure. I'm sorry. I, sure, yeah. And I was asked 10 months after Lucas passed away to speak at the International Employees Assistance Professional Conference in California. And I spoke and I realized for myself that in order for me to sort of get out of myself, even if it's temporarily, for temporary, I needed to speak, speak up, speak out, speak however frequently I could. And then Newsweek asked me to be part of an interview on should all drugs be legalized? And it was an international um, interview. And I did that. And then I saw, I spoke at the New York Bar Association. And then I spoke at a number of other places. I moved to the Twin Cities. And I realized that I could not sit idle. I had to, it was for my own healing originally, the writing. And then I saw Hamilton. I love, I will say, I love Hamilton. I see it like 20 times. I love, I have everything about it. I love it. And I, I didn't see it before I learned all the music. Okay. But when I kept hearing that song, who yes. and I, who lives, who dies, who tells your story, yes. I said, I have to tell his story. I have to tell his story. And then one day I looked at that pile of letters over there and I went, okay, Nancy, start writing. Now, were you a writer before this? No. Yeah, I don't think so. I think so, yeah. No. Yeah. I like to write. I love to read. Um, but... But it just, you know, it's a funny thing. When you're on a mission, but without trying, and it's just happening, flu, you know, but organically, it just happened organically. It was what I was supposed to do. I guess that's the best way to say it. Yep. You know, I listened to your video yesterday um, with Audrey. Oh, I love my Audrey, yes. I love Audrey. Well, I loved it. And I actually sent her an email to have a consultation with her. <laughs> Yeah, very good. No, I love Audrey. I love Audrey. So yes. And I just was listening to her word, the sovereignty of the human spirit yes. and soul. Yes. And that's what's been evolving for me for many, many years. But Lucas's death somehow brought me to this place. That's good. I'm oh, so happy. I love, I love I shout out to Audrey. Hope you're going to see the interview. It's here on JLJ Media. She's the best. Um, one of the best. So I'm glad. And that's, that's why I do these shows also. That's why I do these shows. Uh, oh, it's a gift to everybody. Yes. Uh, and you, I just said, that's the same with this book. All right. So now was it, okay, so let's get to a little bit of the writing, right? So was it, did you know the structure? Did anybody help you? Like, how, how did you get the, how did you get the structure of the book? Because like I said, the book is not a regular, just tell all, you know, here's what happened to me. And that's it. It's, 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 it's structure. There's letters, and there's things, and there's, and there's things you learned. And I mean, you have, you have notes in the back. I mean, like, how did you structure the book? I love the way it feels. That's my feeling. There is a big question about that feeling or hardcover. Yeah. yeah, I like the way it feels. I like the way it feels. Good. Um, the structure. I wrote the book, and then I hired. I, I, I was I was self publishing. Yes. I hired an editor. I found a woman online. Um, she and someone else edited the book. You know, grammatically. I, okay. and I changed it back ninety five percent of it. I said. It's not what I sound like. It's not me speaking. Wow. You know, she couldn't change the letters, of course. Yeah. But I said, I, I, can't, I can't do that. That's not me speaking. That's you speaking. So we put that back. She chopped up two chapters, one chapter into two, twice. Okay. Um, and she had somebody do the book cover, which I adore. Um, and that was it. But you know the Be Bold, Be Brave, Be You? Mm -hmm. Do you see that on the book? Yeah. The Be Bold. So I had bought Lucas, I had bought Lucas this plaque that he uh. had on his desk in California. So um, I took it back, of course, and I made it my motto. Be Bold, Be Brave, Be You. I love it. Um, you tell a story, you tell the beginning, it's about Lucas rewiring, which we call, which we got touched on. It's, it's, a, it's a big deal, of course. Um, it runs the show. Some of the titles of the chapters I like, they're, they're, they're good. It started with this, the brutal reality, which is like, you know, did you, 
When you're writing a book also, since you were writing it, did you have any need to censor yourself? Were you, were you fighting against censoring yourself certain parts or were you able, or did you freely write it? I freely wrote. I did, of course, go back and do editing because I'd wanted to change a word or it didn't flow the way I wanted. But, you know, it was a funny thing. People said, well, what did you do? Spend an hour or two? Because I work full time every night and, and, right. and um, write the book. And I went, no, you know, it could be at four in the morning. I'd wake up and I would be inclined to just go sit and write for two hours. It didn't happen religiously. You know, it was just a spontaneous thing. Um, and it just came. When it came, it came. A hey, divine intervention. Divine intervention. That's what exactly. I call it. Exactly. Without question. Without question. I, I like that. Um, and then, when did you know? When it, when did you know you were done writing? That's like because you know ending yeah. books are always hard. Like, and because yeah. you know, you know I mean, in the book, I mean, the book has other things at the end. But I, I guess I would say your final thoughts, forgiveness, would be the end of the book, so to speak. I guess. Um, but when did you know that kind of would be the ending? But when I got to the point where Lucas passed, okay, I said to myself, what more do you want to say, Nancy? Because there are no more letters to offer. Oh, that's true. Right. And the hardest lesson I've seen most parents face, and one of my top three, was self-forgiveness. Where did I fail? What didn't I do? Same thing we spoke about earlier. So... I knew when I got to forgiveness that I wanted to pass on a message of hope and kindness and love and that there was really nothing further to say after kindness, hope, and love. Not really. There isn't. For me, there isn't. And I'll never forget um, William Moyers Jr. I don't know if you know him, but I live in the Twin Cities now. I left New York seven years ago and I'm in the Twin Cities and of course, Lucas was here in Hazelden. And um, I went to see Bill Morris Jr. speak. And I'll never forget, he said, and Lucas was alive then, if your child's alive, have hope. And I kept saying, okay, Nancy, have hope, have hope. And then when he passed, I went, what do I do with hope? Oh, wow, right. I actually wrote an article for a magazine an addiction mag addiction magazine. Some I can't think of the name of it right now. Oh, yeah. On the gift of hope, um, because you always have opportunity knocking. You just can't always see it. And I didn't know as many as you said at the beginning too. How did you? How do you sit there? How do you keep moving? I don't know the answer to that, James, but believe me, I'm not alone. And people have lost families and multiple children oh, yes. oh, yeah. and lost. I mean, the human spirit is astounding that I can tell you I found out not because I was I'm so strong. Right. But I meet so many people who have struggled and suffered a terrible, terrible loss, a child, a child of children. And. We're here to speak about it. Yeah. I mean, it's it's very revealing the strength of the human soul. It's hard. I always have hope. I have hope right here. I always have hope. My favorite words in the world. Um, I I know that speaking about a child's death, it's hard for a lot of people to even enter a room about and like be around and. I lost a brother so a few years ago. So I Bye. watched a parent grieve their child. I don't know how she does it. I mean, I and I was I'm devastated because my brother. We were only a year apart. We were very close. Um, and I was his last phone call. So I mean, I, before he died. So like I felt all kind of stuff. That's a sibling, right? So we kind of talk about siblings. We talk about parents. We talk about grandparents. You know that kind of stuff. But I always feel like when it comes to especially losing an adult child, we don't talk about it enough. I don't, I really, we just really don't. Like, it's something like, it happens, but just like, oh, we'll leave it over here. But because it's, I think it's just too painful for people. But I think you're right. We have to normalize that adult children die. I mean, uh, parents lose their children as adults uh, to all kinds of stuff. We need to talk about it. And I think, not that it's any easier, and I don't minimize it at all, but if somebody dies of an illness, you can talk about, the prevalence of the illness across oh, the right. country, across the globe. Um, 
this is a subject matter that is so poo poo. Yes. Like, yes. like addiction. Well, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with your child? Um, the we, you know, all of it. Yes. You know, the compassion that people feel when a child dies of an illness or in an accident. True. Um, I mean, people are wiser. Um, they're more open. They're learning a lot more. But it's a very different plateau that you're working from when your child dies of addiction. Have you have you have you now chosen the addiction is disease? I mean, do you do you believe that philosophy or something similar? Or what do you believe? What do you believe? Exactly. I'm very mixed. I don't okay. believe. I don't believe wholeheartedly it's a, a disease. Okay. Completely. Um, that's not to say that I don't believe that the brain gets rewired because I do. I work with Mark Thomas here at oh, the yeah. University of Minnesota Center for Neuroscience and Addiction. Yeah. And he's a brilliant man. And we've worked together, done fundraisers together. And he has really educated me on how the brain is really hijacked. And I know how difficult it is to get that undone. Yeah. Um, and I know that when you get to the point of physical addiction, you are in full-blown addiction. Yeah. So is that a disease? I don't know. The proclivity towards addiction, I think, definitely runs in families, but there's so many components, James, that we don't know. know. Right. Genetics, um, experience, perception of the world, perception of yourself. Everybody's so uniquely different. And that's why I think yes. treatment doesn't work a lot because it's this model that's one size fits all and it doesn't work. There's a guy, do you know Gabor Mate? Yes, yes. I got to know Gabor Mate and to me, he's a, rem a remarkable human being and he believes that addiction is all about trauma childhood trauma yes. and I went to hear him speak at the university here and when he was on a break right it was six months after Lucas passed away I went up to him and asked him if he thought Lucas is did you finish the book I did I did finish the book yes I, I read the whole thing you saw his letter yeah I did so he said believes that Lucas's medical intervention and the first four years of his life were quite traumatic Yes. And that it was a proclivity towards addiction. No, I believe no, because, okay, so when I read, when I was, when I was, when I was saying, bring that up, I was told, because I had some traumas as a kid, as a, before I could remember, but I, I would say, I don't have any good memories of my father, but I was always kind of trying to get his, his love and attention for years, as long as I remember. And I actually had an aunt. Fine, tell me, like, like a couple of years ago, oh, gee, you don't realize, when you were a baby, you were the apple of his eye. Something changed when you turned around three or four. Something changed. But when you, those first couple of years, you were everything to him. But say, Jay, so I, so I go, oh, that's what it is. I'm subconsciously missing that from you him. Got it. So in the book, when you mentioned the letter, that's, that to me spoke to me. I was like, I completely believe that. Completely believe that. There are things that happen early, 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 early that just carry with us. And the study of epigenetics, now that everything yep. is stored on a cellular level yep. from generation to generation to generation. So do I believe addiction is a disease? I think it has a component of disease, yep. but I don't believe that it's all about disease. I think Lucas's mindset, he felt very different. He had a scar on his stomach this big. He was cut open from here to here yep. at the Shiva's fourth birthday. And after he passed, his camp friends told me when they heard that he was sick, they had no idea as a child. They had asked him, because what do kids do? What's that? What's that? Right, right, right. And they asked him what that was. And he said he fell on a knife. There you go. He wouldn't even tell anybody he had surgery. Nope. For some reason, that was something for him. So I lean more towards the trauma side of things with the understanding that the brain and the body changes and the body does get addicted. I mean, uh, on this program and a couple of my others, I interview people who have varying degrees of recovery programs. I'll say it that way. It's the best way to broaden it. But it's I have it's, I've had controversial folks come on here, folks who are traditional I always show every viewpoint because I don't agree that addiction all oh, one size fits all. I just don't. 
I don't. I, I mean, everybody you said, everyone's so uniquely them. Right. I think there should be as many ways to do it as there are people who do it. So and I'm, I sure, you. and I'm sure when you were younger, if you would have said said to your brother, and I'm very sorry about your loss, Thank you. if you would have said to somebody, "What happened?" You and he would have similar but not the same experiences growing up in that household. Oh, I was going to say that. Right. Because our perception of what we see, feel, and to it is uniquely ours and yes. nobody else. That's true. And I have a lot of, I have a lot of siblings and we all are very, I mean, we're very, we have, we have a few things that are kind of a common thread, but then there's so many things that are so different. I and mean, we're in the same household. You're right. We're right. in the same household. We're like stair steps. Like, it wasn't like, it wasn't like one's 10 years older and this one, we're all basically kind of after each other and we all saw the same stuff, but some You heard it different, you saw it different and you felt it different. Yes. And as you become an adult, you handle it different. Correct. You know, um, I was always one of those who went, I like to be deep and go in and I had years of therapy and I worked it all out. And I have siblings who haven't done that. They just haven't. And I just give them compassion and just... Hope one day to get there somehow. But, but I also know the way I did it was my way. So they have to find their own way too. Exactly. And, and, I, and, well, I, and I think on top of um, forgiveness is acceptance. Talking about acceptance. Oh, yes, that's a hard one too. I mean, I mean, you might not like that they're doing it their way. You might want to coerce them to do it your way, but it's not yours to choose. Like, and acceptance is a really hard life lesson. I don't, I don't mean to be funny, kind of, but for me, the first acceptance I had to deal with was when my daughters became parents. I tell all my friends, it is sometimes hard watching your kids' parents. So we always joke about it a little bit, but I'm telling you, sometimes it's hard to watch your kids' parent. So that was my first round of acceptance. I'm just going, this is their kids. I'm the grandparents. <laughs> A little rough. Not, so my not, business. not my business. Not my business. But, so I, yeah. Not, yeah. Listen. Oh. So I agree with you. you know, acceptance is a hard. I, I'm just being kind, but, but acceptance is a hard thing because um, I know it's all. It's always so. And I put this on the show all the time. It's hard to look inward and yes. to come to places. It's so you think it'd be easy because it's you. Like it's just me. You can't run from yourself, but you can run to a certain extent. But you can't out, you can't outrun yourself. It just it, it comes up at some point. But to learn how to forgive yourself and forgive the situation and forgive him and forgive her and and then go okay, I got that part. But now, oh, this is how this is how it is. Okay, now the acceptance parts come in, and that's hard too. Well, because you have you're running from the part of yourself that you don't want to look at, which is really yourself. Exactly. That's which is your real self and working that out. You know, we build, I remember a therapist that said to me years ago when I first started to see him, he said, you know, we're all, all the layers that we build, it's all for survival. Mm -hmm. So we were all very smart, except that when we grow up, everything that we put into place to keep us surviving doesn't work. And then we have to undo all of that. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, well, right. it's just it's crazy. It's it's just I mean, <laughs> the human condition is something else. I mean, our brain it's, building is it's something. Our brain is something else. It is something else. Our it brain. Really I should is. say our brain heart combinations. That's what I should say. It's something. It's else. Such a mystery. It's it just is. a big mystery. It is. As is death, which is the one thing that allows me to hold on to my belief, whatever that that I will see Lucas again. Well, yeah, yeah. I but I don't know. I don't know. Right, we don't know. We I don't know. know. Yeah. But I, he does. You know, I I find feathers today. I'm sitting at my desk. I go to the kitchen. I come back. There's a little feather sitting on my computer. So. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask you. I know. I just. I. I, I, I I'm just. I feel like we should always speak something well of of our loved ones to keep them alive. Um, and I'll start first, like I said, my brother, I just, he had the loudest laugh and his laugh was like, it enveloped every space and made you feel wrapped in it, hmm. like a hug. So I missed that very much. I feel like, and I feel like a laugh was distinguished when he died. That's how I feel about that. And I, and I, I cried for him at Christmas. I, I, I miss him every day. 
What is one thing about Lucas that you really, really miss? There are a couple. The first thing, I miss being called mom. I really, really, really miss Lucas. I was Lucas was an only child. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. And um sometimes, you know, I'm in a store and I hear mom, mom, and I like freeze. I know it's not him, of course, but I know. I miss that terribly. And he too had an infectious, well, he was very physical. He was a hugger, he was a toucher. I miss and he would crinkle his nose when he laughed and it was so precious and you know I miss I miss that and I miss his touch a lot it's always those it's those, it's those little things that are big it's a little right? thing yeah absolutely I completely yes, that. yes absolutely so. Well, thank you for your bravery. And I, I mean, like I said, I got to the interview. I, I got a little future a couple of times, but we got to the interview. You got to the yeah, interview. I uh, did. The car book's called Cardboard House, My Life Altering Journey Through Lucas's Addiction. Um, you can tell people, where can they find this book? Uh, at Amazon. Um, you can either do it by cardboardhouse.com or, or um, under Nancy yeah. uh, Espouche, Nancy Teagle Espouche, or you can go to my website. Uh, cardboard house with a K, K A R D B O A R D house.com, and it's there. The link is there. I'm gonna put the links in the bio below. So, but you can guys, if you're watching this, you can look below and just go right there and you can do that. Um, I, I recommend parents get this book. Uh, anybody who's going through any kind of addiction stuff with someone else, with a son or maybe a nephew or a niece, or I think I think everybody should read this book. Anybody should read it. I think it's, it should be just one type of people. I think everybody should read this book. Um, it's also a great story. It's a. I also view it as a love story. It is a love story. Between mother and son. Said, it is a love story between a mother and a son. I am so glad. Thank you. Okay. Really, I'm grateful, and um, I hope we meet again in person. Me too. Actually, I have family in Minnesota, so who knows? In, in the Twin Cities, so who knows? I haven't been in a while, but I have family there. Well, uh, don't I come. Love I love it. Don't come this week because it's like nine degrees and we have snow and ice. Yeah, I don't but miss that stuff. I don't miss that. I'm like, I also have family in, in a small place called, uh, is it Pelican Gardens or Pelican something? Pelican something. And it's like small. I remember being stuck there one winter and I was like, uh, the ice step? I'm from <laughs> LA. Where's the beach? What's going on? So, yeah. are you in LA? I'm going to come into LA in two weeks. Come to LA. Maybe we have lunch or something. Come to LA. Stephen I am. What part of LA are you in? And then I'll let LAX. You know. I'm in Inglewood, near LAX. Okay. So, I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah, let me know. Uh, so, will. folks, okay, so Nancy has pushed it. The book's called Cardboard House. Make sure you go and get it. Give it as a gift to anyone who you think needs it. And I just think people should read something that's a great story about someone's life. We, we don't want to we don't, we want to forget them. We want to remember them um, and share their stories. And maybe you'll see yourself, maybe for you, you'll see yourself in it. Who knows? Reading the book, maybe you'll see yourself in it. Um, but please go out and get it. I'm James Lott Jr. And you can follow me where all James Lott Juniors are at James Lott Jr. Also do your platforms. Um, a lot of help.com is my website. I'm also a certified life coach. So I'm open for sessions all the time. You can find out all the, the rates and everything that's on there, of course. This show is on every single audio streaming service from iHeartRadio, Spotify to Apple. So if you're listening, hello, listeners. Um, we, I appreciate you guys. Um, go ahead and follow it. And uh, and also check out all the interviews we have there. I, mean, I talk to very amazing people on this on this show. You do. I think no, I do. I, I love it. I, it's one of my favorite shows to do. Um, so and I think it's I, we, I'm here of service. This is what we do. I think of the village. Nancy's part of my village. We're all part of the same village, and we lift each other up. Uh, also, this is on my YouTube channel. I'm one of the few folks. Few Men of Color has its own YouTube channel network. It's called JLJ Media, and it's a playlist called A Lot of Help. And you can go ahead and check out all the interviews on there too. And follow so the subscribe button. I always get it wrong. It's down here somewhere or down here. It's, it's a red yeah. button. It says subscribe. Um, go ahead and hit that button and subscribe there. And check again, check out the content that I have. Um, I have other shows called Extra Connections in between the pages where we review books. I, I try my best to bring all points of view, all kinds of help to this network to share with you out there um, because we're all in this together, folks. We're on this. We're in a, no man is an island. No woman is an island. We are all in this together. And I want to thank you so much. Everyone have a great new year. 
It's going to be a, hopefully a rebirth of everybody, a rebirth of New Year. Yes, please. Right. <laughs> yes.